Good morning. <clears throat> Let me try that again. Good morning. Let me get my voice working and woken up here. Welcome to worship this morning in, uh, at Good Shepherd's Lutheran Church for our fourth Sunday in the season of Advent. And as we've been focusing on preparing ourselves in the season of Advent today, with Christmas right around the corner, we prepare to receive our Savior. Because we have the kind of Savior who does not expect us to do everything. In fact, he doesn't even expect us to do anything. Today we have the solemn joy of just preparing to receive. That our God is just going to give to us his grace and his mercy through the incredible gift of his son, Jesus. We'll be following the order of service printed for you in the bulletin. And our opening hymn is hymn 12. Hark the glad sound, the Savior comes. May the Spirit of God richly bless your worship this morning. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray. Have mercy on me, according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin, and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will.
Stir up your power, O Lord, and come. Take away the burden of our sins and make us ready for the celebration of your birth, that we may receive you in joy and serve you always. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. Our first lesson this morning is taken from the Old Testament book of 2 Samuel, chapter 7, verses 8 to 16. This is right after David had decided he wanted to build a temple to the Lord, but the Lord had said, no, not you. And it's incredible God's grace here. He basically says to David, you're not going to build something for me, David. I'm going to do something for you. And he gives him this promise of the Messiah. This will also serve as the basis for our sermon. Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture and from following the flock to be ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men of earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore, as they did at the beginning, and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest, from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with the rod of men, with floggings inflicted by men. But my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. This is the word of our God. We now respond with him 37 verses 1 and 2. Our second lesson this morning is taken from the New Testament book of Romans, chapter 16, verses 25 to 27. With these words, Paul gives a short doxology, doxology to our glorious God. And he also points out the mystery of salvation for all people that we find in the manger. Now to him 
who was able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all nations might believe and obey him. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. This is the word of our God. Please rise for the gospel. Our gospel lesson this morning is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. It's the account of Gabriel visiting Mary and telling her that she will bear the Messiah. This is the fulfillment, not just of 2 Samuel 7, the earlier reading, but of all the Old Testament prophecies. For now the Messiah will be born. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. We continue with the hymn of the day, hymn 23.
Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in abundance for me who is and who was and who is to come. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, I've made no secret of the fact here at Good Shepherds that I don't like HGTV. Now, if you like it, that's fine, but I have been very upfront with that. I just cannot take the HGTV channel. How many TV shows can you possibly have about remodeling old houses? They've got like 18 of these things, and they all follow the same general trajectory. But despite my blustering and complaining and whining, which my wife will attest to, despite my high-minded criticism of HGTV, I still find myself once in a while getting hooked on an episode. I can't help it. You're watching this couple and they're choosing between which house they should buy and renovate. Is it house A or B or C? And then it gets to that point of the episode where they're going to tell you what they chose. And, I, and it's like, ah, oh, why did you choose B? Why did you choose the blue house? She wanted a big kitchen. That doesn't have a big kitchen. This is going to be a nightmare. I can't help it. I get into it. It's the allure. The allure of building and remodeling houses. Well, brothers and sisters, in our text for this morning, the Lord is building houses. In fact, that's what makes the text this morning a true Christmas text. Christmas is all over these verses. Because here we see the Lord give a prophecy and a promise. He will dwell with his people. And nowhere do you see that promise fulfilled more clearly than when you look at the manger. Now our text for this morning is 2 Samuel chapter 7. This is a major prophecy in the Old Testament. It's one of the major prophecies. But it may be helpful as we read it and understand it to remember the occasion for this prophecy. If you remember from Wednesday, in the sermon on Wednesday, Pastor Wentner pointed out that David had wanted to build God a temple. David had the desire and he made the decision, I want to build God a temple. But God had told him, no, not you. You have blood on your hands, David. You are not the one to build me a temple. However, God had been pleased with David that he had had this desire in his heart. I'm going to read from you a short verse from 1 Kings chapter 8. This is what God said. The Lord said to David, Because it was in your heart to build a temple for my name, you did well to have this in your heart. What was in your heart was good, David. Your desire to build a temple for me, this was good. This is commendable in my eyes. What was in your heart, David, was good. And David's desire to build a temple was a good thing, not just because it was an offering, which it was, as again, as you saw in the sermon in, in Wednesday, David and the people gave a huge offering to begin construction. But it was more than just an offering. See, David understood that the tabernacle, the tent they used for worship, every time the people of Israel looked at it, they were reminded, God dwells with us. The Lord dwells with us, his people Israel. We are under his protection. He showers us with his blessings. And David knew, if I build a temple... That'll be an even stronger reminder. Every time people walk past it, if I build a temple on the highest part of the city, every time people walk past, they will be reminded of God's promise, I dwell with you, Israel. This is why God said, what you have in your heart was good, David. You were trying to be a good shepherd for my people and remind them that I am with them. This is good. David's not the one to build the temple. And yet look at the grace 
that God now shows David in our verses. Because this is God's response to David after God has told him, you won't be the one to build my temple. In verse 11, the Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. You see the grace of our God. David had an idea to build a house for the Lord. And the Lord says, nope, you're not building me anything. David, I'm going to build a house for you. I'm going to give all of this to you. But brothers and sisters, we've reached the point where you have to ask the question, which house? Which house is the Lord building? In a moment, I'm going to briefly reread the verses of the prophecy, and I want you to ask yourself this question as you listen. Is God talking about Solomon or Jesus? Or both? When God says to David, I'm going to build you a house, which house? Solomon or Jesus or both? When your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with the rod of men, with floggings inflicted by men. But my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Which house is God building David? Is he talking about Solomon or Jesus? Or both? And as you may have guessed, he's talking about both. Both Solomon and Jesus here. There are certain verses that are clearly talking about Solomon. Right? Like when he says, when he does wrong, I will punish him with the rod of men. That's clearly talking about Solomon. Jesus did nothing wrong. Yet there's other verses here that clearly can't be talking about Solomon. For instance, when God says, I will establish his line forever. He will reign forever. Solomon didn't reign forever. He died. The Lord is telling David here, David, I will give you a son. He will be your successor, and he will build a house for my name. That's Solomon. And the Lord is also telling him, David, I'm going to give you another son, a greater son. And he will reign forever, and he will build the house for my name. And that's Jesus. And what is a very interesting thought, dear friends, Jesus came, he reigns on the throne of his father forever. What's the house, the temple that Jesus built? The temple of the Lord. It's us. Remember what Paul said? You are being built up as living stones. The temple of God is holy, which is you. It's an interesting thought to look at 2 Samuel 7 and realize that what God is promising David through the Messiah is us. All believers who have been joined together by the blood of Jesus. We are the fulfillment of what God promised David here. Again, listen to the words in our gospel lesson. What did Gabriel tell Mary? The Lord will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign forever. Gabriel is referring to 2 Samuel 7. Brothers and sisters, you see the Lord building houses here. You see a clear arrow pointing at Christmas, the promise God shall dwell with his people. And dear friends, 
This is exactly the part of Christmas that Satan likes to sweep under the rug as often as possible. Look at what he has done this year, what he's doing right now. Now, I know that many of you will watch this service online. For a variety of reasons, because of safety, and so you choose to watch online because it can be dangerous for you. And I would say to you that what you have in your heart is good. You want to be in the Lord's house. You desire to be with us here in the Lord's house. But you can't. What you have in your heart is good. This is commendable in God's eyes. What you have in your heart is good. But I also know based on my own behavior and my own temptations, that there are some who watch us online and you do so because it's easier. It's much easier in the morning. Don't have to get ready, don't have to prepare, you can watch at your leisure. And those things are all true. However, I would say that what you have in your heart is maybe not as good. The Lord wants us to gather together in his house. He is very clear about this in scripture. Do not let Satan, because of a matter of expediency, tear down that house for you. And brothers and sisters here today, Christmas is right around the corner. We're in crunch time, right? Thankfully, this is one of the few, this is the only year I can think of where I got my shopping done. I am scrambling for nothing right now. But it is crunch time for us. Preparation time. Whether you're going somewhere or having people over, you have to get everything ready. And dear friends, I would say to you that what you have in your heart is good. That's good. That is commendable in God's eyes. Christmas is a big deal. As the children of God, we know that better than anybody. It is good. It is good for you to desire to make Christmas a big deal for you and your family and friends. What you have in your heart is good. But if the preparations are costing you more focus and energy than preparing your heart for your Savior, then what you have in your heart is maybe not so good. Because finally what we see today in the prophecy given to David is that Christmas is not so much about you preparing your house to celebrate Jesus' birth. It is much more about Jesus coming to build you a house. Which is precisely what he did. David with joy understood there is one coming who will reign forever. One who will build a house for his people. And you understand everything that's put into that notion of Jesus building you a house. That means all of your needs, your eternal needs, have been taken care of. Death has been defeated. Satan has been stopped. Your sins have been washed away. All of your eternal needs have been taken care of. You have eternal life and the promise of joy in God's presence forever. Jesus has built you that house. He even said, I go to prepare a place for you. It also means that all of your needs now are in his hands as well. These have also been taken care of. I build you a house. He takes care of what we need for our body, what we need for safety, what we need for joy or any of those things. Jesus, the one who reigns on the throne of his father, David, forever. Who is the fulfillment of the promise when God said, I will dwell with my people. They will be mine. Brothers and sisters, this Christmas, as you look at the manger, remember 2 Samuel 7. And stand in awe as you see the fulfillment. The Lord will dwell with his people. He has built us a house of salvation forever. Amen. Would you please rise?
Now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in true faith. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We now join to confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Almighty God, we praise and honor your holy name for your numerous acts of love and mercy on behalf of your people. We especially thank you for the gift of your one and only Son, who came to us one midnight still in a manger. Send your Holy Spirit to enlighten our minds with understanding and knowledge of your heavenly truths. Give to all who serve your holy church a full measure of your grace, that Christ may be confessed, his cross uplifted, and his gospel declared as the only way to eternal life. Bless all parents that they may be wholesome examples to their children. May they teach their children to love you, to desire to pursue instruction in your word, and to serve your church and all people. As we, lo- as we leave this hour of worship, we give all glory to Jesus, our Savior. To him be praise and honor and glory and power, now and forever. Amen. And we join to pray as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for our next hymn.
Please stand. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. You may be seated for our closing hymn. Is my mic on now? Okay. All right. Two announcements this morning. First, for our Christmas Eve and Christmas Day worship schedule. Uh, it's been a little bit of a challenge this year. As you guys know, we've made it clear to try and make sure that we have the right amount of services so that people can worship safely, but at the same time so we don't have an empty church for a Christmas service. Uh, with that in mind, what we've done is the evening Christmas Eve worship services are all the same, 3.35 and 6.30. However, on Christmas Day, we will not be having the 8.30 a.m. service. We will still be having the 10 a.m. service, but not the 8.30 a.m. service. Uh, so ignore what you see in the bulletin there, and we will make sure to get this info out this week so everyone knows, but we've decided to cut that service. And then secondly this morning, I do have a letter here from our teacher, Nicole Tranberg, who is holding a call to St. Peter's. Dear members of Good Shepherds, on Sunday, November 22nd, the voters of St. Peter's extended a divine call to me to serve as the kindergarten teacher, organist, and music coordinator. Over the past few weeks, I have spoken to members and faculty here at Good Shepherds, as well as from St. Peter. The information shared with me was valuable, valuable as I deliberated the two calls and where I may best use the talents our Lord has given me. 
This has been a very difficult decision for me to make throughout this entire process. I have greatly appreciated your prayers as I considered where I may best serve the Lord in the public ministry. Through the Lord's guidance and prayerful consideration, I have decided to accept the divine call which St. Peter has extended to me to serve as kindergarten teacher, organist, and music coordinator. I am confident that St. Peter is where the Lord wants me to help further his kingdom. I pray that the Lord will guide good shepherds in finding a first and second grade teacher, choir director, and organist. Your sister in Christ, Nicole Tranberg. Well, though, it's probably not what we wanted to hear. We certainly also know that the Lord blesses, and we're excited for the things he has in store for you and Tom in St. Peter's. And we still have plenty of time to not only show them our affection over the next few months, but you know, have some pranks ready for Tom when he gets home. And with that, may the Lord richly bless your week.